So hello everybody and welcome to our talk, an event handling system for uh, serverless platforms. Um, I'm Jules, um, not the award-winning Jules, the other Jules. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm working for uh, IBM Cloud for almost two and a half years now. I'm in the Cloud Foundry team. And yeah, what is this um, talk about? So this talk is a story about bringing two technologies that are considered as two distinct technologies together, which has a positive effect on when working with service platforms as a developer, and it may have positive eff effects um, on the costs when working with service platforms, depending on uh, the use case. Okay, so we'll first go through the fire exit announcement. Please note the location of the surrounding emergency exit and located the nearest lit exit sign to you. In the event uh, of a fire alarm or other emergency, please calmly exit to the public concourse area. Emergency exit stairwells leading to the outside of this facility are located along the public concourse. For safety in an emergency, please follow the directions of the public safety staff. Okay, let's come to the uh, agenda. So first, Simon will give you an introduction to platform as a service and um, function as a service and the motivation behind this project. And I will tell you more about the problem that we're facing here and an example how we tried to solve it and what we actually implemented and finally give a conclusion. Okay. All right. That's my kickoff. So thank you. Um, so my name is Simon. I'm the... Uh, also working on the Cloud Foundry team, I'm kind of leading like the Cloud Foundry efforts inside of IBM to, to some extent. And the motivation for this talk really, or for this work, a body of work was that on the IBM Cloud, and I'm pretty sure it's similar for other vendors that are out there, we do have a, a separate set of um, technologies that a customer can use in, and mix and combine in order to accomplish um, certain use cases. Um, <laughs> About a year back, um, we kind of started looking into a scenario where we have, it was, it was originally driven from a pure serverless standpoint. So we, we, wanted, to, we wanted to have a, an application that was constantly emitting events, and it, what, those events were coming out of the sensor, and it was kind of like, it was a student implementation to some extent, right? So it wasn't really industrial strength at the time, but the problem that it really surfaced at this, at this stage was that the serverless platforms themselves, they just execute whatever you give to them, right? There's no filtering, there's no nothing. And um, can you just swap to the other side, right? Whereas the... And, and of course, that's in the true nature of a what a serverless platform does because it is reactive to events, right? You send it an event and, and you, you do something. Whereas Cloud Foundry or platform as a services are more for, um, let's say, long running, always on kind of applications. So I'm guessing that everybody in this room knows this picture. I, at least I'm hoping when you're here at the Cloud Foundry Summit, so I'm not going to talk um, a, lot bit, a lot about it. But basically, the, the key thing is Cloud Foundry provides support for long-running applications and as well as tasks, but in our case, we really focus on long-running applications. Um, it, intro it has automatic health management and cloud-native programming model where you only worry about your code and nothing else, um, and so on and so forth. On the, the function, functions as a service, um, the, the way how this works is a little bit different. I'm, I'm using the... Uh, the model from um, uh, a project called Apache OpenWhisk, which is another open, open source project, um, that the IBM Cloud is actually um, building its serverless offering on top of. So the way how this works is a little bit different than Cloud Foundry. Um, there is this concept of a trigger, um, and then um, you have a concept of what is called an action, which is basically the thing that will get executed when, you, when the trigger gets pulled. So um, that action can, of course, also be implemented in, this, in a variety of, of uh, programming languages. Um, it could be a Docker image. It could be like a cloud a foundry application, some kind of a function, that sort of thing. 
Um, but what happens is whenever the trigger, whenever the trigger gets killed, um, the ang the action engine uh, picks up that um, picks up that that action and actually starts running it. And that might mean it'll provision a container on demand, execute that action as part of that container, the whole nine yards. That has a bunch of um, side effects, right? So first and foremost, it actually introduces an event-based programming model. An event occurs, something happens, event occurs, something happens, event occurs, something happens. Um, when nothing, no event occurs, nothing happens, which has a cost benefit at the first sight at least, right? It has a cost benefit that says, oh, if I'm not getting traffic, traffic through the night, I'm not gonna pay for my application that's run, or I'm not gonna do anything you know, I don't have to pay for idle times. I don't have to pay for, for these kind of things. Um, the second advantage that the serverless platforms claims are saying it's inherently scaling. If I have a lot of events coming, it'll inherently scale. Whereas, for example, in Cloud Foundry today, you have to build a management function to do that. It's not that you cannot do that. You can, but you have to build a management function that does exactly that, right? Say, okay, I define a threshold, more than 3,000 requests per minute, then give me another instance, like scale it up. It's a management function. For a serverless platform, that's not really needed because it just happens on demand. Um, yeah, and then, um, then, of course, it has some, well, apparent cost-effective a cost effect because you only charge for what you need. Like if you have no traffic on your app, you're not gonna pay anything because nothing is running. Right? At least that's what it looks like at first sight. Right? So then we said, okay, is this really the, the, the case? And um, um, basically there is this scenario that is called an event storm. Um, and let me quickly do a show of hands. Who, who understands what an event storm is? Well, Andrew, you don't count. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, so there is a scenario called an event storm, and, and um, I'm just going to talk about this. What we're going to show in this talk, it's, it's an artificial example where we try to artificially create an event storm and then try to bring those systems together in order to um, see how do they best mix and match. And all the magic that has happened was this going to do? <laughs> okay, thanks, Simon. Okay, so what are event storm scenarios? Um, an event storm scenario uh, when it is, appears when a set of IoT devices or any other events uh, source is generating a large number of events in a small period of time. And when think about, uh, about how many smart devices we today have, it's Usually, it could be the case that such a scenario appears, right? And what's the problem, actually, with an event storm scenario in case of serverless? Well, so today we have the, um, the uh, events, uh, event source, and if an IoT provider, for example, uses serverless, all the events are facing directly uh, the, the um, service platform. And this could be potentially, uh, this could potentially lead to a system overload, and uh, which slows your system down. The execution time increases. The uh, customer uh, gets charged for that, and so on. So a lot of downsides on that level, on the technical level. And what about all these events that are coming directly into the um, serverless platform? Are they actually relevant? So. In, mo in many cases, not in most cases, it depends. Um, they may be just uh, um, not relevant and can be ignored. They're just noise. So let's just say a simple example. You have a dog and you have a GPS sensor and you want to make sure he doesn't leave a specific area. So um, you're just interested if, so, so the GPS sensor is sending all the time events to the service platform and you always check in your function Hey, is the dog still in my area? Yes, don't do, don't do nothing. Is it still in my area? Yes, do nothing. Now the dog leaves the area, then you check, does he left the area? Yes, now you want to inform the customer, maybe, hey, your dog just left the area. And that's actually the only event that you are really interested in. And that's what you need to cover today in your function. 
<clears throat> and of course, for all these unnecessary um, function invo invocations, you also get charged, so you have to pay for them. And that's what we try um, to avoid. So what is our example solution? Um, so we want to do a cloud platform-based solution. And most of the cloud providers today offer both. They offer platform as a service and a function as a service, but they run next to each other. So what we want to do, we want to combine those platforms to handle those event storm scenarios. And on the platform as a service side, we want to have a event handling system which is filtering all the incoming events and strip them down to an amount of just relevant events that are triggering the um, serverless platform so the developer at the end can just focus on what he really wants, wants to do in his function. And yeah, such a system uh, needs the ability to scale it definitely and um, it should be able to filter, deduplicate and all that stuff. So that's the target state that we want to reach. Maybe before you, before you go on, um, Jules, so the event storm itself um, is, is something that you can, you know, obviously comes with scale, right? So think about every morning at six o'clock when everybody in America gets up, you would have, a, you'd have an IoT device that sends out whenever the, the light bulb or the, you know, the, the, the light gets turned on and out of the, in all of the houses, right? So this is like all of a sudden you get a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of events and if you want to process them with a serverless platform, that's just probably too many and most of them are, if you, particularly if you're looking at a, some kind of an alerting scenario, you're not interested in them. This is not what we used. We actually built a cool car, but <laughs> Jules is going to do that. Okay, so we had a target state that we want to, to have and what we did, we started a student cooperation project and um, we're stu free students, including me, so I did my master's beside my full-time job at IBM. And one of the students built that nice car and applied a bunch of sensors uh, at it and uh, like a temperature, a humidity sensor, infrared sensor, gyro sensor, a compressor, pressure control. So a lot of stuff, there was some Arduinos in it uh, inside and um, Raspberry Pi, so really cool thing. And um, yeah, so the motivation for that was um, actually the automotive and uh, uh, smart cars, connected cars. So that's why we built that. And we had to, uh, we wanted to build a proof of concept. So really an MVP based on a specific scenario. And in that scenario, we had this proto car which was generating different types of data. And it sent that data directly to the IBM cloud. And from there, we used the, um, the IoT service as IoT gateway, and we consumed all the incoming events in our um, event handling system, which was based on Cloud Foundry, uh, to filter them and uh, strip them down to re really just relevant events that are actually triggering the serverless platform. And the serverless platform has functions that gave a feedback back to the car. So that uh, overall was like a feedback loop. And we'll come to, uh, to that later. You will see a demo of what we actually did. Okay, so let's take a look at the event handling chain, how it looked like. So we had events. We had an X position, a Y position, Z, Z position, temperature, the main unit temperature, and so on. But we was really just interested uh, in the Y position, so in the gradient of the car. And then we had a filter and applied a filter rule which said, okay, I want to include all Y position events, which has value greater or equal than, uh, to X. And just, and uh, after the filter, we had a correlation which said, okay, I want just those events that are uh, hold for a specific period of time, let's say like five seconds. If we have um, an, uh, events with the Y position of equal or greater than X for let's say five seconds, then we will trigger the uh, 
serverless platform which will compensate the gradient of the car. Okay, so let's take a look uh, of an example. Let's say you have like 100 million events monthly and you apply filter, you may halve them, so you just have 50 million uh, events monthly. And if you apply the correlation rule, you only have 10 million um, in, uh, events monthly. So that would be like a 90% saving, uh, yeah, you strip them down to uh, of 90%, and which, is, which could be cleared a lot in specific scenarios. So let's take a look at numbers. So on the IBM Cloud, if you have a standalone uh, serverless platform, you would uh, pay for with a basic rate of 0 0.00017 cents, with an, and you have an execution time of, let's say, an average execution, execution time of one second with 100 million execution. So 100 million events means 100 executions. That would be like $425. And if you now have this event handler, which is a microservice architecture of 10 instances, and let's say each has 512 megs of memory, you get uh, charged uh, per gigabyte hour with seven cents. That would be like $225. But now you would have only this 10 million executions, and that would be just $42 on the serverless platform side. And sum this up, you would be at $268 which would be a saving of, let's say, 40%, which in specific scenarios, like event some scenarios, could be quite a lot. Okay, so let's take a look at a demo that we, uh, so at the demo with the, with the prototype car and what we actually did. Let's start the video. So we had a UI where we could set up the event correlation chain and we had to filter and we could say, okay, I want to apply a specific filter rule, so include or exclude something, uh, uh, events, based on a threshold. And we also could um, apply the correlation rule based on the time that we want to have. And then we hit the activate button and we are ready to uh, send data to the IBM cloud. So here, the car start to move, to change this gradient, and we had that main unit what, which was sending all these events to the IBM Cloud. And in the IBM Cloud, we could see the logs in the UI of the specific components, and here we see all the coming events that are sent by the prototype car. And here, for example, we have the filter logs, we could see w uh, how many um, uh, events w uh, were excluded. Here are the correlator logs, which showed the events that actually triggered the event-based platform. And finally, in the serverless platform dashboard, which was uh, in this case OpenWhisk, uh, we could see also that uh, events that triggered the uh, serverless platform. So then we had a, like a small dashboard in our event-based platform, and that uh, red bar shows all incoming events, and the blue bar uh, shows all outgoing events. So it visualizes how many events you actually filtered out. And you can also see the numbers above. So here. So it's so that ran for a few minutes. Let's let it run a little bit. So I actually cut it a little bit. So now you see it went up to 149. Let's go a little bit back. Yeah, there we go. 149 incoming events and only 10 events actually triggered the event-based platform, and that's more than 90% that was actually filtered out when we run that um, scenario. And finally, the functions in the serverless platform compensated the gradient of the car, and that was the feedback loop. OK. 
chain. Okay, so how our uh, microservice architecture looked like. So uh, we had, so all these blue um, colored components were actually CF instances that were the instances that we um, developed ourselves. And we used different technologies like Golang for the backend and Node.js for the filter and the correlation and uh, AngularJS for the front end. And we also used uh, services on Cloud Foundry for the message bus and the IoT gateway. Uh, that's actually the yellow ones. And the green one is um, the serverless platform. And as you can see, that's the 10 components that we needed to implement this system. And yeah, um, let's go to the conclusion. So first of all, we had a higher cost efficiency, right? In case of event storm scenarios or, or if you have, if you know that you produce a lot of noise and you know that you can ignore most of your events. And the second thing is that we have a more efficient handling of events because now we have a specific component that just just there to handle events. And of course, we have a reduced network load on the serverless platforms and an improved performance too. And another important thing is that we have a combination of the best fitting programming models so that was the thing that the programmer of the functions doesn't have to uh, concentrate anymore on how he handles those events in, uh, in the function itself. It, he, he can just um, focus on what the function needs to do. And, and just to, to add to that very last sentence, because I think really this should be the takeaway uh, message from this session, right? So wh whenever you get confronted these days, and I mean, I personally do get that a lot, you probably do too, like having something like a pass platform or Cloud Foundry and having something like a serverless offering, um, in neither case is an either or, right? It is always an and. And it, it's because a lot of the customers that I talk with, there many of the times it's like, oh, should I use serverless or should I use pass for this kind of kind of stuff, right? And the, the question itself obviously is not really smart, but um, I think this talk or this conclusion really shows that if you pick the right tool for the right job, you can actually combine the strengths and get things moving forward. And I think that's really what, uh, what the takeaway of this, uh, of this talk should be for those who have not you know, realize that, and hopefully we made it a little bit transparent with the demo. Yeah. So we have like five minutes left. <laughs> Thanks. So, of course, if you have any questions, this is the time. <laughs> None at all? Oh. You, you mean, you mean as, as like the, a filtering function as part of the OpenWhisk platform? Um, maybe. I mean, this, this is, it, it kind of would, it, 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 it's a natural thinking to have some, such kind of like an event correlation or event um, filtering mechanism as part of a serverless platform today. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think any of the serverless platforms today have anything like that. Um, I'm, I might be wrong, but I, so I, I, don't, I don't know. It, if we would put it, push it back to open whisk, it kind of defies the purpose of our talk to so that you can actually combine the two, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a valid request. At, at this point in time, I'm not 100% sure whether, like there's no active work going on to push this into, into open whisk, but I'm not ruling this out at all. Of course, I mean, the, for this is this is just the, the like I mean the, the 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 intention of this of this exercise was really to say, can we combine this and what are the what are the things that make sense and combine them both from a technology standpoint, fair, as well as from a you know financial economical pricing standpoint, 
And um, yeah, of course, coming from Pivotal, if you want to implement, like you would have probably implemented that correlate or some, uh, some way of your Spring platform. Uh, that's a natural and obvious choice. Um, sure, you yeah. can do that. Do, do the math and see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, do, do the math and see if it, if it works out, if it makes sense, and what, what, the, right, what, the, what the best solution would be. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it really heavily depends on, on the signal to noise ratio that you would have for, for, for the a serverless platform. Um, because you're right, I mean, we, we, we cheated a little bit on the math, right? In, in the sense that we did, not, we did not count how much investment it takes to actually write that correlation application. And you know, there's a development cost associated with it that if you really do it properly, you should have probably accounted for. So we, we cheated on that piece. but. Uh, so no, I, we don't have like we didn't. We we just try to exemplify this um, as as a thing. But my gut feel is, as soon as you have something like a higher, higher than fifty percent signal to noise ratio, um, it's probably paying off. But this is not scientific evidence. This is my gut feeling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> More questions. Okay, then thanks all for attending and enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon.